Welcome to Talking Up Music Education, a podcast from the NAM Foundation. The NAM Foundation is working to assure that all children have the opportunity to learn and grow with music and that music is part of daily living for everyone. Talking Up Music Education podcast shares news and stories about music education from teachers, students, parents, school, and community leaders who care about music education and are working to create more opportunities for music learning. And now, here's your host, Mary Lurson. Hello, everyone. This is Mary Lurson, Executive Director of the NAM Foundation, and welcome to Talking Up Music Education. We are here on January 20th from the NAM Show, recording live from the NAM Show, on this, the Inauguration Day. So it seems very fitting that I have with me a really wonderful friend and colleague from Americans for the Arts, Jeff Poulin, who is the Arts Education Program Manager for Americans for the Arts. Welcome, Jeff. Oh, thank you, Mary. It's a pleasure to be here. You are on another whirlwind tour of the States. Where have you been recently? Uh, recently, I'm actually just coming off from a small break, but in the fall, we were um, all over the place doing local trainings um, in small communities, state-based trainings uh, with uh, some NAM folks in Indiana um, and a couple of national conventions with our peer arts education organizations. And you've been with us here in Anaheim since Tuesday. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's been really fun. I've seen more ukuleles than I can count um, <laughs> and a real pleasure as always here at the NAM show. And what do we do Wednesday afternoon? Talk Wednesday, about we had a fantastic day um, with a bunch of NAM leaders that are passionate about music and arts education. We had a boot camp, if you will, talking about advocacy strategies, the latest in arts education policy um, in Washington, D.C., and figuring out how to really translate that to empower all sorts of different leaders from business leaders uh, to teachers, parents, students, and so on in states across the country to make sure that every student has equitable access to music and arts education across the country. We had a great day, and it was my job, I guess, as boot camp sergeant, sergeant at arms, to really get people to dig into the process. You gave us such great guidance, and I was really thrilled the way they actually moved through the process, and they came out with some real to-dos at the end. Absolutely. There are some definite success stories from that, and really uh, an action-oriented attitude, which is my favorite part about working with NAM members. Yeah, great. Well, if you haven't captured the essence of Jeff Poulin in the, ne- in the first few minutes of our conversation, he is very high energy. He is very intelligent and intense about his subject. Tell us about your background. Sure. So, and your um, interest in arts education. Absolutely. Well, I am really proud to say that I'm a direct result of arts education. Um, I grew up in a small town in southern Maine, but a small but a very arts-rich town in southern Maine where I had opportunities through my K-12 education to study music and art and dance and theater. And uh, as a young person, I got very involved in a local dance studio and a community theater where we were singing. I played the drums for a bit of time um, and ultimately found my path as a tap dancer. And through my journey, I learned that um, I was able to pick up different success strategies in life, um, like time management and working with other people collaboratively uh, through that passion for uh, tap dance. And as I got into college and beyond, um, I transitioned more into the administrative role and realized that not every young person had opportunities like I did. And it really fueled a passion in me to make that change. And it was then through graduate school and, and after that, that I committed to making that change on a basis of policy, that when we enact policies in the United States or in our states or in our local communities, we can make sure that every student, not just those who can afford it or those who live in towns with uh, the funding and opportunities for them, but every student across the country can experience that same arts-rich community that I had and that same arts education that I had. And so since 2013, I've been with Americans for the Arts, making sure that every policy that is advanced in the country, whether it be in Washington, D.C., in all 50 states, or in the 5,000 local communities that we work with um, have arts-friendly provisions in them to ensure that every student has the opportunities to learn and grow in the arts. I want to talk a little bit more about the power of policy. I I like to call it the power of the stroke of the pen, Mm. right, when a policy is thoughtfully written. But tell us about your training. You went offshore to get your 
arts cultural policy training. I did. I did. In 2012, I went and did a graduate program in Dublin, Ireland, where I um, got a master's degree in arts and cultural policy at University College Dublin, which is one of the uh, initial programs um, for the study of arts and cultural policy um, in the world. And in this program, I specifically took on a liking for education policy as one of the four sectors of cultural policy. Through my research, I looked at various ways that states within the United States dealt with arts education policies, as well as how various nations within the EU dealt with arts education policies. And the timing was great. It was at that time that the Republic of Ireland was passing their first national arts and education charter, which was a policy that worked to make sure that every student in the Republic of Ireland had opportunities to learn um, and study in the arts. Uh, So I got involved with that and ended up working in arts education in Ireland for a bit of time before returning to the United States to do similar work at Americans for the Arts. And I think, didn't you tell me once that if one one wished to pursue that master's degree in arts cultural policy, you pretty much have to go to Ireland? Yeah, you it's can. It's not really, we probably could weave it into a program in the States, in the university in the States somehow. Yeah, there are programs um, all over the world in this, but they're very specialized. Uh, and this program had a comparative view. So we studied not only Irish policy because we were there, but also North American, um, larger European and around the rest of the world. But it hasn't really, we don't really have a lot of programs to choose from in the States. No, there aren't programs quite like this one. There are components of cultural policy and programs, usually in master's degrees, but uh, not anything quite like what I, yeah. what I did. And I think that speaks to some of our priorities, too, that we all keep working on, right? So look at the power of the stroke of the pen, the power of the policy, right? And I agree with you that even an informal policy on the local level can create enormous access. But when that policy is formalized, let's say by graduation requirement or by course requirement, then it becomes standardized for every child, right? Absolutely. That that gear, that shift from informal policy to formalized uh, policy is really essential when we're trying to talk about opportunities for every student. Uh, We can have lots of opportunities with choice, but once you have um, that stroke of the pen, as you call it, or that policy in place to make sure that every student is having those experiences, that's when we really, um, really achieve equality for our students. And better yet, if we have equitable policies that favor students who are systematically disadvantaged, we really achieve the ultimate goal of making sure that all students are learning in ways that uh, reach them uh, in their own circumstance, regardless of zip code or race or gender um, or uh, financial situation, uh, to be able to learn through the arts. You and I have worked together in I affectionately would call sort of the birthing of the Indiana Arts Education Network. Wonderful process working with our NAM member there, NAM members there, also the Music Education Association, and that expanded very fairly quickly. And I was so impressed by the way they set the policy for their work. Can you articulate the policy for there with that every child in Indiana? Every child in Indiana has a creative learning experience or something like that. Uh, it's uh, That was a fantastic experience and a really great success story of bringing folks together. Um, this group in Indiana, which you can listen to the podcast that we filmed or that we recorded there. Just last November. Just right. last November. Scroll I got to back. sit in your chair. <laughs> Scroll back. Jeff, Jeff was the moderator of that conversation. Um, but we, we explored with that group of people. People, you know, how they started it with an informal working group over the course of 18 months, bringing together, uh, you know, really assembling the table that they were going to sit at. Uh, and then a phase of inviting new people to that table, regardless of where they were, whether it was uh, their peers in the music industry, um, others from the education sector, or those in the broader arts and cultural sector that care about music and arts education. Um, and just most recently in November, we talked a lot about messaging and targeting an audience and figuring out what those policy asks are. And right now, it's such an opportune time for that with the passage of the new Every Student Succeeds Act and state plans being developed, that this group is really flourishing and accomplishing their goal of changing policies to be more arts and music friendly. And and going back to this policy conversation, they started with this big, broad policy statement that they were working that every child in Indiana had an ac- had access to high quality arts education. I mean, that was the, so everything flows from that. Absolutely. So again, the power of the policy, the power of the of the, uh, of the stroke of the pen. Um, 
So you've been working with various states around the country, right? I mean, that's why you have uh, how many frequent flyer miles, boarding pass stubs on your uh, carry on uh, carry on bags. Uh, What are you experiencing state to state? Uh, Well, that's the thing about the United States is when we talk about education policy, there's some stuff that happens federally, but largely when we talk about American education policy, we're talking about 50 different state policies. So it really ranges um, from very uh, detailed policies to more broader and more encompassing policies. Um, But what we see is that generally across the United States, uh, the arts and music are part of the conversation, which is great. And that's a legacy of uh, years and years of advocacy and federal policy guidance in this um, arena to make sure that the arts and music are part of that conversation. However, in any time of change, there's always a big question mark. Um, So what we've seen are some really early successes to make sure that the arts are included in the definition of a well-rounded education, Um, specifically that we're talking about all of the arts in dance, music, theater, visual arts, and media arts. Tap dancing. (laughs) Tap dancing, of course. Um, And beyond that, we've seen the arts pop up in different areas that are a little more um, untraditional, like the accountability systems. Uh, in Kentucky, there's a certain percentage um, of consideration for the arts f- per every school. In Connecticut, they've developed a metric measuring student growth and creativity. Uh, so these are really ways that the arts and music have led the path for others to develop unique and different policies that really address the learning needs of students in their state. So be, because a tradition of arts in arts education advocacy, arts culture and arts education advocacy has developed and really been led by Americans for the Arts, through this next transition, would you say there's more people at the table representing their, we are better and more adept advocates? Is that a big part of why 50 states can develop 50 different versions of this and yet we're still getting at expanded access for Music and arts education? Absolutely. For a number of years, Americans for the Arts has led the charge uh, working with a number, you know, almost 100 peers, 90 some odd partners um, in developing uh, shared messaging to push that envelope on the policies regarding arts and culture and specifically arts education. Um, So working together for the reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act was a massive undertaking with several different attempts over the last 10 years or so, culminating in 2015 with the passage of the Every Student Succeeds Act. But largely, the nation as a whole has been moving more towards state-level directives um, when it comes to arts and culture and when it comes to arts education. So there's also a network of arts advocates out there uh, that work together from the state arts um, advocacy organizations to the state MEAs, music education associations, uh, to informal networks of NAM members even that are all sitting at the table working to broaden uh, the ask and to increase the pie, uh, if you will, to yeah. really achieve that goal. And I think as state and local advocates, they, they're, they're fearless in wanting to learn what is the process, how do I connect as opposed to knowing exactly what to do and knowing exactly what to say at the table. No, there's, it's more, it's a, it's a learning modality and a sharing modality that I think has also been fostered among arts edge. Just get in there and start. Right. I right. think that's Just the first step. Just get in step. there and start. Connect. Make a connection. Exactly. Building those relationships is is really essential and following the guidance. I mean, we've all uh, taken civics. We know how a bill becomes a law, but putting ourselves at that table is the first step. There's been a, um, and we do admire Americans for the Arts and been honored to be part of that partnership through all of this. And we had a great time this last summer with the political conventions and uh, we've made it to the inauguration and we will continue to work together on all these important things. I think there's um, a part of the next conversations just within the arts community itself, and you are, are out there working with us all, all the time. How best do community arts and cultural organizations work together to increase public school arts education programs? Sometimes, you know, the question is how do we uh, increase arts education opportunity in the public schools is to pay for more field trips for more kids to go to museums. All good. We want all the kids to go to museums. But how do, do more of these partners in the community work to actually put the pressure on the publicly funded education system to get arts education 
robust and in a good continuum in, in the schools. At Americans for the Arts, we really endorse a statement that was put out a couple of years ago with a number of partners called a shared endeavor. And the shared endeavor model looks at how certified arts educators and K-12 publicly funded schools partner with teaching artists or community arts programs who all partner together with the non-arts uh, academic subjects. And in this model, we see two massive benefits. Uh, the first being that the students are at the center and that they benefit from a sequential standards-based arts education uh, with arts integrated into their other subjects as a vehicle for achieving the goals of those other subjects. But we also see a Secondary benefit in not only the school culture, but in the professional development and professional learning of the educators. So when we look at this model, we see that the uh, certified arts educator gets to work with one of their peers that's a professional artist in the field um, that's making music every day or directing theater every day or choreographing dance every day. Similarly, that teaching artist is learning how to better their skills in classroom management and evaluate programs. And together, they're working with the non-arts academic educators, like the history teacher. And those teachers are forever learning how to integrate strategies from the arts into the learning and assessment of their curriculum. So is the English teacher teaching Shakespeare from a book? Or are they acting it out? Is the uh, history teacher embracing um, learning different time periods through different types of music, tying back to the music curriculum? Um, you know, how wonderful is it if a student is learning about uh, 18th century France to learn about 18th century French music and then see a performance of it and maybe even play it themselves? That's the type of model that we really look to see to pair those community arts providers with the uh, certified arts educators in the classrooms and throughout their other subjects in the school. So you've really done a thoughtful, there's a thoughtful document here that we need to be sharing as well. Absolutely. And, and Americans for the Arts takes that a step further, where we talk about a shared endeavor, but we also talk about shared leadership. Um, and in that shared leadership, we work to foster relationships between those community organizations, but also parents groups, local businesses, community and civic leaders, so that they can support that model in the schools and in the classrooms to flourish as well as it can. And and hopefully that they can also serve as a, a political for, force for adequate funding and support. Those right? things take funding. And what we know about more and more of the laws that are coming down is that funding is broken into several ways that actually support this model. Direct funding for supplies. Funding for spaces where this, that can allow this to happen that are appropriate for the art form that's being taught. Funding for teacher professional development that can bring those arts educators together with the community organizations and the professional artists to improve their own teaching and learning. So we're only limited really by our, our openness and creativity and thinking that this can work. Absolutely. Right? And it is an and, it's a both and, not an, not an or proposition. Yeah. So that's very helpful, but we'll have to refer to that document on our website and make sure everybody knows. The name of that document is A Shared... A Shared Endeavor. A Shared Endeavor, available at Americans for the Arts. And they, all of the partners, uh, yeah. Sure it <laughs> it's all over the internet. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, as the leading national arts organization, advocacy organization, and this on January 20, our inauguration day, what's next? And what's the role of all of us who care about all the work we've done so far and all the um, challenges and opportunities ahead. I'll start by saying that um, I think there's a lot of uh, tension in the country about what might be coming as a big question mark for the future um, in the policies of our new uh, administration and um, the next chapter of uh, life in the United States. But let's also just think back to, for those of us that watched the inauguration, there were arts throughout. You saw the Mormon Tabernacle Choir perform. You saw Jackie Evanko sing the national anthem. You saw a choir, a student choir from the University of Missouri perform. There were designers that worked on all of the flags and posters that were held up. Uh, and even on the other side, there were artists that were providing the artwork for the posters of the protesters. So there were arts and culture throughout the, uh, the entire event today. And that really should signify how the arts are pervasive throughout our culture and our society in the United States, and that we all are tied to arts and culture as a whole. And as that applies to arts education, uh, we recognize that. Nine out of 10 Americans believe that the arts are part of a well-rounded education that should be in our schools for every student in the country. Uh, and that only is validated by the fact that our Congress, in a bipartisan effort, passed the new Every Student Succeeds Act, which will uh, supersede this administration. Uh, but 
What we can't do is we can't become complacent. And as a field, we continue to work together to ensure that that federal act is fully funded and to ensure that there's funding for the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Institute for Museum and Library Services and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, which all work together as the federal cultural agencies in the United States. I mean, it goes beyond just the direct funding to nonprofit organizations to really the commitment of our country and our society to the value and power of the arts and culture to transform communities for the arts, to transform schools and for the arts to really help us deal with the challenges that face our nation. Um, so I hope that we can continue to build on the bipartisan support that Americans for the Arts and all of our partners have fostered in Congress and that leaders um, from across the country have fostered in their state governments. And we can come together as communities to ensure that every student has equitable access to arts education, every community has arts and culture at its center, and that really we can achieve healthy and equitable and vibrant communities across this nation through a public commitment to the arts. I can't think of a better call to action than that, Jeff. So I think we'll kind of leave it at that. And we needed that positive um, message to all of us that regardless of who our elected officials are, the arts are a bridge to the world that we want to have together. So I thank you so much for being here at the NAMM Show, for once again being part of Talking at Music Education. I think you've, you're logging a lot of episodes, and we love it. And I thank you all of you for listening today to Talking at Music Education, coming to you live from the NAMM Show a podcast of the NAM Foundation. The NAM Foundation would like to thank Vocal Booth for their support in providing a recording booth for these podcasts recorded live at NAM Show 2017. Whether you're recording, rehearsing, tracking, mixing, or overdubbing, Vocal Booth has a solution that's right for you. Learn more at vocalbooth.com. Talking Up Music Education is a podcast created by the NAM Foundation. To learn more about how you can support music education in your community or how you can be part of the work of the NAM Foundation, visit our website, www.namfoundation.org, or join us on Facebook at facebook.com slash NAM Foundation. You can also follow Mary on Twitter 